is that? <laughs> yes, it was. Oh God, the future is horrible. <laughs> oh, we are so screwed. <laughs> This podcast is designed for the purpose of entertainment and information and is not meant to be considered medical advice. What? It's not? No. Are you sure? Yeah, our lawyer said we can't do that anymore. Aww. show about medicine. We'll be famous one day. The guy you just heard is Dr. Christopher Labos. And the other guy is Jonathan Jarry. I'm a doctor, but he's not. Sorry that I did biomedical research instead. Jeez. And we're going to look at the evidence behind medical topics. And the show is... Wait, wait, wait. No, I want to say it. I want to say it. No, no. I want to say it. I want to say it. I want to say it. I came up with it. It's the body of... Body of evidence. It's the body of evidence. You totally stole that from Madonna. Welcome to episode 100 of The Body of Evidence, which is not our 100th episode. Technically, no. Because we have a bunch of episodes that are not numbered. Are not numbered, yes. But this is episode number 100, woot, woot. which is our Ask Us Anything episode. Yeah. And uh, we will do this in three parts. Mm-hmm. Uh, the first one, if you're on YouTube at all, yes. uh, you've probably stumbled upon one of those gimmicky celebrity interviews where the celebrities have a new movie out. Now they go over to, let's say, BuzzFeed, Mm -hmm. they play a game, they get interviewed by Variety, there's a different gimmick. So Wired Magazine does this thing called uh, the web's most searched questions. And so the celebrities in front of a white background, they're handed these big foam boards, and on them is a screenshot of a Google search for their name and what autocomplete search suggestions show. And they have to answer them. And since neither of us, Chris, unfortunately, Mm. will ever be on the same celebrity level as Ariana Grande or Tom Holland. I I reject the premise of that statement. And since doing the puppy interview Mm. that some of them do would have required way too much planning. I mean, we do have the 365 dogs calendar, which you just bought right next to us, but it's not quite the same as playing with puppies. I will will endeavor to bring a doggo for the next recording. So I thought that we would do the web's most searched questions before we get to our patrons' questions about us. So when we type in Christopher Labos yes. into Google... Great things come up. What is the first autocomplete suggestion? Does coffee cause cancer? The book. That is Doug your book. That, that is, is my that book. That is correct. That Does is actually coffee? your book. Book by Christopher Labos. So. Which you can still order. You can still order. Yes. Go out and buy it. I was just doing a book signing uh, earlier today. Indeed. And it was uh, fun. Yes. We had a fan of the podcast come out to the book. She's like, oh, I love the podcast. You guys got me onto uh, the Conspirituality podcast as well. And I was like, oh, thank you. That's very kind. There we go. See, we're paying it forward. Yeah. Um, next up is Christopher Labos A. Yeah, people really want to know how <laughs> old I am. It's interesting. Whenever I meet people in, in real life, uh-huh. they always say, it's like, oh, you look so much younger in person. <laughs> the camera adds 10 years. I guess so. <clears throat> I guess so. Which, known is, fact. which is surprising. I know. People are like, oh, my God, you look so much younger in real life. Do you want to reveal your age to our podcast listening audience? Well, I use the Julian calendar because I'm <laughs> Greek, so I won't be born for another 85 years. I see. So it's very, it's very good. Yes. But I can tell, I don't know, should I tell people? Do you think people really want to know? Well, the Google, the people who Google your name want to know. I am 40, hold on. Two. 42 years old. I have to think about that for a second. What, I, I couldn't remember what year this was, technically. <laughs> Christopher Lavos' wife. Yeah. That, well, that was a screenshot you had sent me like a while back, oh, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, it's been, it's been, it's been a, 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 a common search for a while now. Yeah, it's Christopher Labos married, Christopher Labos wife. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, no, not, not married. I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, <laughs> he says looking at his hands. I'm looking to see if there's a ring on my finger. I don't think there is. Nope. Uh, no, not married. There is a, there is a, a lovely young, young lady in my life. You uh-huh. may have heard her of on the Of age, pun. we should say. I mean, yeah. you say young, 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 but I mean, she is of age. She is of age. It is age appropriate that <laughs> yes. we should be seeing each other. Uh, you have heard her on the podcast if you've mm-hmm. been paying attention. So, uh, she is currently not with us right now. She is in another room. not with us. It sounds like she died. Yeah, no. <laughs> since no. the recording began. She's in I good health. I did just see her like five minutes ago. Yeah. She is alive. She is alive and she's doing well. Indeed. Christopher Labos, Montreal Gazette. Right. I mean, I write for the Montreal Gazette, so I think people, uh, if, you know, if they're searching for an article, will usually do that. And then usually the most recent article will pop up, but you never know with the algorithm what's going to shoot it, shoot it off. But yeah, that is, I think, the, the fastest way for people to sort of find the Gazette articles, usually by typing that into Google, which is why it's coming up. 
Christopher Lavo's podcast. That's this. That's that's what we're it's doing what right now. Right now. No. That's what we're doing right wow. now. Our podcast is called The Body of Evidence, which you know because you're already listening to it. So, but yeah, you know, people. It's. I mean, people do come up to me and say I listen to the podcast and I really like it. And I'm like, oh, thank you. So I mean, these are obviously we do have listeners. We do have listeners. Sometimes it feels like we don't, but we mm. do have listeners. We do have listeners, and some of them are local, and some of them are not quite so local. Um, but yeah, it's it's nice when we meet you in person because it's nice to interact with people we don't get much of it especially with you know podcasts which are not a very interactive medium we do no. get our patrons who yep. you know post comments and ask us questions so it's nice to interact with people christopher labo's cardiologist that is my day job Indeed. and that is what pays the bills because it sure isn't science communication <laughs> it really isn't and Christopher Labos Twitter. Twitter, yes. Twitter Twitter is a thing that exists, and I am on it. Mm-hmm. And I guess if you wanted to sort of find my Twitter stuff, that would be the way to go about it. But yeah, I'm still there. It's not, I mean, I was never a big fan of Twitter, and it's definitely not quite the same uh, since Elon Musk took over. It's called X now, right, officially? Yes. Mm-hmm. But yeah, you know, but it is. But people are not Googling Christopher Lavo's mm. X or Christopher Lavo's no. triple X, no. which would be very which worrying. Would be, which would be worse. <laughs> which would be which would be weirder. Um, yeah, I mean, it's still it's still called. Well, it's not officially called Twitter, but most people still refer to it as Twitter. Isn't the Ooh. URL still Twitter.com? Yeah, a lot of it is, and like. <laughs> For a while, even on the, uh, if you went on the phone versus an iPad versus a browser, mm. it would come up different ways and the uh, the apps, I, the icon apps would be different. And so I it see. took a while for them to transition over. Why? No logical reason. Just we want to change the name. I think, I think there is a backstory to the X thing. It's from his days... When I he think was, he also he's just in love with the letter X because he think it looks cool and he wants to name yeah. everything X. Yeah, there was some. There, I think there is some backstory to it, but I, can, I don't know the details. So there you go. Who cares? <clears throat> Indeed. All right. Next mm. up is me. Is you, Jonathan Jerry? So the first thing that comes up is Jonathan. Is your name Jonathan Jerry? And it says Canadian scientist. That's, with that's a, a link to my Wikipedia page. Ash link to the Wikipedia. Do you have page. a Wikipedia page, Chris? I have a Wikipedia page. So st- strange thing that happened. They were um, uh, one of our listeners, uh, Robin, was spearheading the the effort to put the page together. Put it together. It went up. And then one of the senior people on Twitter, Wikipedia, uh, on Wikipedia, uh, said it took it down because I wasn't prominent enough. <laughs> which was strange because the minute uh-huh. that happened, I got a slew of emails from people saying, "It's like, oh, we saw your Wikipedia page oh. was thing. It's like, would you like to pay us and we'll like uh, put it up." Oh, interesting. I yeah. see. Okay. Yeah. So, and I suspect this is what a lot of people, because it's not that expensive. Like people advertise, it's like $150 to create a Wikipedia page for somebody. Okay. So I think a lot of people just pay mm-hmm. someone. But still, there's, there's, there's a regulatory framework. Like you have to be notable enough to warrant the page. And that's yeah. a judgment call on their part. It's a sub- subjective thing. And yeah. I guess if you can also, if you're the, if you're the, the gateway and you get to decide, and you also have a side hustle where people pay you to make Wikipedia pages. <laughs> I don't Conflict know. of interest. Yeah, and I got like a few different emails from like different individuals. So I'm like, oh, okay, so that's the that's thing. And I mean, you look at some of the Wikipedia pages, like why is this a Wikipedia page? I suspect it's because some people just paid. Mm. Well, and again, is there anything wrong with that? I mean, people pay to somebody to build a web page for them, right? I mean, yeah. I don't know. So I didn't have to pay for my Wikipedia yeah. page, by the way. Yeah, and I didn't, although the book... Uh, has a Wikipedia Indeed, page, so yes. the book "Does Coffee Cause Cancer" has its own Wikipedia page. Mm-hmm. So there you go. That's the first thing. Then your next search result is Jonathan Jerry, age forty-two. Yeah, we are the same age. Yeah, because we've been friends since childhood, <laughs> apparently. Well, that's one of the questions that's coming up later. So we'll do. Um, and then the next one is Jonathan Jerry podcast, which it's, is again it's this, this podcast. Is podcast. This it's podcast. amazing. Yeah, so I think people search for the podcast and they just you know they they do that rather than or maybe maybe i mentioned it on ctv news and like oh he has a podcast mm, interesting yeah. let me look look this here we go well and it's always it's also i think there's an interesting science behind how people look for stuff because mm. it used to be that you remembered websites oh yeah um and now it's like no no i'll find it on google by yep. hitting the the search terms and i will hope that the google algorithm shows me what it is that i'm looking for yeah which is becoming less and less reliable yeah and so it's interesting that people search for our names rather than the name of the podcast 
title. Yeah. Uh, although maybe they well, are. Yeah, maybe it's they just, are, It's yeah. just not coming up in the autofill suggestions yeah. of Google because we don't know how the algorithm works because it's a mystery. It's a black box. And possibly nobody at Google knows how the algorithm works because it's taken on a mind of its own <laughs> and it will soon be sentient. <laughs> Indeed. Um, Jonathan Jerry, Andrew Huberman. Huberman, yeah. Huberman. Uh, I was one of his first public critics, I think. Yeah. Uh, so I've written a piece about him. Yeah. He's a super popular uh, science podcaster yeah. who is becoming more and more divorced from evidential reality. Yeah, right. <laughs> and so I guess that's why people are looking at both of our names. Uh, I've written about this and I've been on Conspirituality to talk about him as well. Yeah, so they're probably, again, looking to find the article, which again is an interesting thing because rather than going to the source you know the 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 mcgill oss page yeah. they're like oh i'll just rely on google to take yeah. me there which is int- i mean it doesn't take much extra effort but i think we just become reliant on the algorithm to give us the pages we want yeah i think it's also easier because then you can look at the results page and scroll down and see what you're looking for and click directly mm-hmm. on it rather than navigate through a page or i wonder also if it's if it's getting the queries from like uh those google assistant apps things mm-hmm. yeah where, where people just voice a question right or voice like a string of names and i don't know yeah yeah oh jonathan jerry wikipedia yep. is well, i have one about I'm that. On wikipedia, wikipedia yeah. page. there you go uh i'm i keep rem- i keep re- i keep leaving myself notes to go and edit it in obscene ways and i keep forgetting <laughs> <laughs> um, anybody can edit a Wikipedia page, eh? Yes, but then there are people that are monitoring what's yeah. happening, and they they might unchange your changes. Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> did I ever you tell you the try. Did I ever tell you the story about the aspirin edit I did once? No. There was a there was a there was a big aspirin study that came out, and I was like, oh, let me get involved in Wikipedia. <laughs> so I went to famous added, last words. Yeah. So I went because they have a page on aspirin, and uh-huh. there's you know such a medical uses of aspirin in the okay. study. So I added a one sentence line about this one study, and it was removed. They're like, no, we don't cite <laughs> primary sources. What? That's what it said. That's very strange because, yes. I mean, of course they would cite primary but, sources. But no, the rule on Wikipedia is no, we cite reviews. So you have to rev- cite an very article strange. that reviews that. But like on, on Andrew paper. Wakefield's page, surely mm-hmm. there is a link to his Lancet paper. Right. But again, it's the luck of the draw of who goes by this page. You're like, I don't like this. And hmm. so there's a, I, 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 the minute I saw that, I'm like, okay, well, I'm not going to. I'm done with Wikipedia editing. <laughs> it's like, no, but it's like, because they have an interesting thing and like you can, you can train to become an editor. And I thought, oh, this is important. Like mm-hmm. we should yeah. contribute to the scientific thing. And I thought maybe this is something could start doing and these like start you off small. And, uh-huh. like, you start off by doing like, grammatical corrections and more you substantive stuff. You started with one stuff. sentence and then you're like, I'm out of here. Well, the, They don't like me here. Well, then you get to the point where you're like, now you can add to the pages. Right. I'm like, oh, okay. And they're like, no. <laughs> Reversed. And I was like, okay. Um, yeah, because you know what the rules are to be able to create a web page, to create a Wikipedia page? No. Nope. You have to have an account that is more than one day old and have done right. 10 edits. Oh, okay. I see. So... I was like, oh, okay. Training wheels. Training, yeah. And I was okay. But I was like, no, there's all these rules. And I'm like, oh, I don't have time for this. I don't like these rules. I'm just like the guy in the resident. Yeah. I refuse to live. <laughs> yes. I refuse to live by somebody else's rules. <laughs> um, yeah. So I found that very strange. Like, you can't mm. cite primary references, which was weird. Okay. I don't know. Very anyway. strange. Yeah. Uh, and then the next one is Jonathan Jerry Twitter, but you're not on Twitter anymore. I'm no longer on Twitter. Do you so. still have your account to look at uh, things or no way? Eh? No, nope, I'm just, through. I've destroyed the whole thing. Okay. It's gone. Because you don't need an account to read other people's nope. Twitter stuff. You nope. can just read it. You just yeah. can't discuss. I do have a secret account that I use for that. Okay, for like scrolling through stuff. Yeah. But even if you don't have an account, you can still read. I believe so. Yeah. You I can just so. through your browser. Yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, so that's Twitter. We're also on Blue Sky. You can find us there. Indeed. We'll see which social media platform becomes the most dominant one in the world. And then finally, the last one is just basically a contraction of your name, John Jerry. Which is not my nickname. I don't go by that. You don't go by John at all. So there people, you go. Some so people that's, are looking for that. That's what people want to know. They want to know your age and what you know what your podcast is it's all very professional stuff very but, then, professional but stuff. then when we search for is christopher, christopher labos yeah we get is christopher labos married yeah and then the variant of that is, is dr. dr christopher, christopher labos, labos married? married uh which again is no uh if that <laughs> changes yet. if that changes i will let you all know <laughs> and you are all invited to the wedding will the podcast be uh, known as a primary source will it be citable we'll see maybe <laughs> Maybe. Now, very important question mm. when you type in is Christopher Lavos mm. is 
who does Christopher end, end up, up with? with? And, um, you know, he might be the woman who voiced the role of Katie in our uh, chapter reading of the book. It may be. It may be. Uh, we'll keep you. We'll, we'll keep you apprised. And then it says, "Where is Christopher Maloney now?" <laughs> well, he's not here. He's not here. Uh, he's somewhere else. Uh, it's an actor, right? Christ- no, wait. I don't know. Maybe hold it's on. a character. Hold on, hold on. I get confused with my Christophers. I try to keep. I try to remember who I am. It's not Christopher Nolan. That's a different person. No. Is Christopher Maloney the actor from Law and Order or something, something? Yeah, an American singer, songwriter, bass oh. guitarist, and music educator. Oh. Okay, well, maybe there's a different Christopher Maloney. Maybe there's a few Christopher Maloney's. English singer. Okay. And then the last suggestion is, mm-hmm. is Christopher biblical? Yeah, well, I mean, it, it is in the sense that the word Christopher means the carrier of Christ. Right. Christophoros, right. Christos is Christ. Yeah. Photos means to carry. So that is where the name comes from. Yeah, I see. Yeah. So you are carrying, I am God's gift. Uh, no, well, so... Yes, the, that's what Jonathan means. Oh, that's what Jonathan In Hebrew, means. Yes. I see. Yeah. Okay, interesting. So, you know, we're both very biblical. <laughs> yeah. Well, so if you want the backstory of Saint Christopher, that uh-huh. was not his original name. The story is that he was... Um, like Paul. He well, changes name. Yes, exactly. So I forget what his original name was, but he was sort of a local strongman, like this big brutish guy. Okay. And one day he was by this river... Or he did something bad and his like punishment was he had to help people across a river. And one day, this manifestation of the Christ child showed to him. He's like, can you help me across the river? And he did. And he's always portrayed as carrying the little baby Jesus on his back because ah, he was ferrying him across the river. And he became known as Christophoros. I see. So there you go. A little hmm. bit of, of biblical knowledge for you. There which we go. I, I'm guessing you weren't expecting on this podcast. No, no, exactly. <laughs> the body of Christ of evidence. Yeah. And then, then what's next? So then it's your name. Yep. As if we type in, is Jonathan Jerry? <gasps> so strangely enough, the autocorrect drops the Jonathan, which I don't understand. Oh, it's just, ref- yeah. It's just the way that I screenshot it for some reason. It oh. just, yeah. All right. Anyway. I blame you for this. Is, yep. is Jonathan Jerry married? Nope. Nope. Is Jonathan Jerry still married? I never was married. Is so. Jonathan Jerry still alive? You tell me, Chris. Are, are you sure? Are you I sure? think I'm still alive. Yeah. That's a weird thing for people <laughs> to <know>. search for. <laughs> maybe because when I did the interview with the CBC, I was like, I do receive death threats. Mm-hmm. So maybe somebody was like, oh my God, is he still alive? Mm. It's been two weeks. Maybe he's dead. Uh, and then again, even weirder, is Jonathan Jerry a Canadian? Yes, I am. And are you a Canadian citizen? Yes, I am. Okay. And then we also have Jonathan Jerry Age, which we talked about, yep. same name. And then Jonathan Jerry McGill and MSC. Yeah. So I I mean if if the question is is Jonathan mm-hmm. Jerry McGill no, no I am you are not, not the McGill. university but I am employed by McGill. Yeah. Again, strange syntax from the autocorrect. <laughs> yes. Indeed. Uh MSC, well you have an MSC yep. in science, that's good. And then the next one is just blank. It's like is Jonathan Jerry with nothing filled in. Some people apparently search for that. Okay. And is Jonathan Jerry bio? Well, it's funny cuz in French in Quebec bio means organic. Yeah. So am I organic? I mean, technically yes. Well, and I guess also to a sense it could be like b- biologic like it doesn't it's not really the same no. type of contraction they want, they, want, they want to get to my biography i yeah, guess i guess so and they just don't know how to how to write properly yeah. all right and finally we have does christopher labos yeah which again switches over to <clears throat> is christopher yeah. labos yeah. married yeah yeah <laughs> people really want to know they Chris. really want to know <laughs> it's it's the major preoccupation <laughs> that people have does um, does coffee cause cancer christopher labos again cling to the book which i guess is a good sign sell yeah. wise so there we go who does Christopher end up with, once again? We'll see. And then finally, does Christopher end up with Sherry, and does Christopher stay with Sherry? Yes. Who is Sherry? Because uh, I, I met your girlfriend, and her yeah, name is not Sherry. She, it is not. No. Ta, ta, ta. I, I think, I think, and I am appalled by your lack of knowledge of pop culture, because uh, this is a Gilmore Girls reference. Oh, right. Christopher was Lorelai's... The diner's uh, owner, the owner of the diner. No, the diner owner is Luke. Oh. Christopher is Lorelai's... Right. His, her ex. Her ex. Well, the, I, don't know, the, I don't think they were ever the technically married. Rory. The father of yes. Rory. Yes, okay. And then Sherry was the woman he was with. And then Sherry uh, left him okay. when they moved to Paris, I want to say. And so okay. there was this interesting thing, like, would he get back together with Lorelai? Ah. Which, interestingly enough, the actress who played uh, Lorelai mm-hmm. did not really get along with the guy who, like, played the diner owner, the Luke. Oh, really? She wanted 
her character to end up with Christopher. Oh. And uh, that's not the way the show played out. So. Okay. So, Jonathan, I'm thinking, I think the body of evidence should become a Gilmore Girls rewatch <laughs> podcast. We would certainly get more listeners this way. Have you, have you, have you ever watched the show? I saw the first three seasons, I think. Oh, wow. When, okay, she, when she goes off to college, I was just like, I'm done. Oh, wow. That's more than me. That's yeah. impressive. Because then Matt Zucri comes in, yes. who would later go on The Resident. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just couldn't stand. I was just like, I'm done. Really? This okay. show is stupid. Okay. Do you want to do a rewatch podcast? No, we could do, do it not. for our patrons. <laughs> sure. I just want. I just want to see you <laughs> like. In, we... I just want to see you like increasingly like lose your mind as you're forced to watch this. Yeah, especially since whenever Rory would get kissed, she mm-hmm. would like just run away. Yeah. Like she was, she was so overwhelmed with feelings, mm-hmm. she would just run away, and the guy would be like. What the hell? Like, mm. where did she go? Mm. She literally runs away whenever she's kissed. Mm. Have you heard the theory that this is all like in her mind and she's like writing this at, cause the, the, oh. the, which I'm, I'm assuming you never saw the Netflix special, the four part no, Netflix no, special, no, no. which was how Amy Sherman Palladino, the showrunner really wanted the show to end because she oh. left in the last two seasons. Oh, okay. It's so like, this is how I wanted the show to end. And it mm. ends with her writing a book called Gilmore Girls. Ah, oh, I see. It's about her life. And then we were like, oh, have we just been watching the book? Because, mm-hmm. again, the way this young girl behaves, a little out of keeping with how a normal teenager would behave. Well, so. I mean, most characters on this show do not behave the way that normal people behave. Yeah, exactly. It's so you're, very stylized. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So you're wondering, is this all just the memory I of see. her as an adult looking back on her life and... Because her, her character on the four-part Netflix special was, some people felt, untrue to how she was depicted in the show. Oh, I see. So was that, was that the in-universe explanation? Hmm. So for those of you who didn't think you were getting a Gilmore Girls analysis when you listened <laughs> yeah. to this podcast, now you know. Now you know. Now you, you know. You got one whether you wanted it or not. All right. And now we do the Does Jonathan Jerry mm-hmm. aspect. Does, uh, does Jonathan Jerry speak French? Oui. Oui. Très bien, monsieur. <laughs> <clears throat> Does Jonathan Jerry have a child? Not that I'm aware of. Not that you're aware of. <laughs> it would be of. very, very surprising if I did. Indeed it would. And then kind of the same things again, actually. Does jo- Jonathan Jerry yep. age? Jonathan Jerry McGill? Jonathan Jerry biologic in case somebody wants to eat you? <laughs> yep. COVID, uh, I guess, yeah. Strange that that didn't come up in the other searches, but only yep. in the does Jonathan Jerry yep. thing. So there you go. Do I COVID? I mean, I, COVID? I, I like to not COVID. I like to not COVID. COVID was unpleasant. Yeah. And then uh, again, what we saw before MSC, Wikipedia and McGill University. Indeed. So there you go. Nobody wants to know if I end up with Sherry. Nobody wants to know if you end up with Sherry. <laughs> <laughs> when we come back, we asked for your questions and you delivered. Mm. So we answer your questions about who can eat the hottest pepper, our favorite books and the placebo effect. That's after the break. So we got a couple dozen questions from our patrons. Yep. I've sorted them into health-related questions and personal questions. And we'll start with the medical stuff. With apologies to all the people who were horrified by our long digressions into Gilmore Girls <laughs> and Google algorithms. Indeed. So Mike asks, can you guys tell me anything about restless leg syndrome over and above what I can find on Wikipedia, etc.? Thank you. So uh, surprisingly enough, the Wikipedia page on restless leg syndrome was actually quite good. Wikipedia is a good reference. It really is. Like, don't don't cite it in your uh, academic work, but I mean, it's a good place to start. As a starting point, it's not bad. Yeah. Um, it's going. It's not going to give you specific studies, because again, they have this rule against citing primary research, which I highly doubt. But anyway, I'm sure somebody will uh, write in and clarify this. I mean, but no, that's literally what they said. They're like, we don't cite primary research. I think um, somebody was on to you. They were like, I don't like this Christopher fellow. He's writing things about aspirin. What's he doing on Wikipedia? This <clears throat> is my turf. Um, so yeah, the Wikipedia page is not, is not bad. Um, the, the only, like the, the actually highlight stuff that most people don't know that restless leg syndrome is actually, there's a pretty strong link between that and iron deficiency, oh, okay. uh, which is, you know, a thing most people don't realize. One thing that they don't really talk about on the Wikipedia page is that uh, restless leg syndrome is very common in pregnancy. Hmm. Yeah, and, I didn't know that. Yeah. And you know, sometimes the first manifestation of that can be during pregnancy. Huh. And so that's an interesting link. For what that's worth, okay. um, it's also known as Willis Eckbaum disease, which I did not know about. Uh, There's because, always a name, and it's always two white dudes yeah. 
who co-discovered it and mm. now yeah and you know and, and one of them might be a nazi one of them might be a nazi <laughs> we just don't talk about it anymore what happened in the 1930s stays in the 1930s <laughs> well unless you were naming diseases back then yeah so and i mean we are sort of moving away from naming diseases after people now and i, I mean to be fair i've literally never heard this name before i learned mm. it for the first time reading up before this episode and really most people call it restless leg syndrome although it does sound like very important like if somebody yeah. is well i have willis egg bomb disease, disease. what yeah. <gasps> yes yes yeah. yeah. and i mean i think people do trivialize restless leg syndrome it can be very very disruptive to people and of course it prevents you from sleeping and that yeah. can be symptomatically very very problematic um, I mean, the causes of it, just to sort of give people a firm a grounding in it, is uh, th there are certain things that make it worse. Alcohol and caffeine can make it worse. We said iron deficiency anemia. And the other thing is that things that block the action of dopamine, so certain medications will do that. Hmm. Uh, there's a lot. So antipsychotics typically block dopamine. But a lot right. of people are prescribed the what we call the atypical antipsychotics for their sleep-inducing potential. So I see a hmm. lot of these as sleep, and that, that could, in theory, make restless leg syndrome first. So if you are getting something like ketiapine, for example, not not that you would be, but I mean, you know, it's not common. Not familiar with that drug, but okay. Yeah, yeah it's in, you know, anyway. So the point is, I, I, I always do a review of medication to make sure that the dopamine, that it doesn't have dopamine blocking actions, see, because that could be the cause. Yeah, and there and then and you know there is a, 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 I don't want to say a school of thought that might be putting it too too firmly, but you know there is conversations that this is part of the same classification of movement disorders that would encompass like Parkinson's disease because Parkinson's mm. disease is a movement disorder caused by dopamine deficiency. Uh, Restless leg syndrome is a different type of movement disorder um, caused by dopamine deficiency. And the treatment for restless leg syndrome for people who need chronic therapy is dopamine agonists, things that boost dopamine levels either by hmm. giving you dopamine or giving you an, a drug that acts like dopamine. And so um, these are the, so the same medications that you would prescribe somebody for Parkinson's disease would also work for restless leg syndrome. So that suggests that there's a pathologic link between the two. So um, yeah, Mike, I hope that, uh, hope that helped. Do you know if people who have restless leg syndrome are at an increased risk of developing Parkinson's disease later in life? They might be. I think it's, I haven't seen any specific research on that, but it might exist. It's, okay. I, it, 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 the problem is this, is that uh, Parkinson's disease is going to occur later in life and restless leg syndrome is going to occur earlier. So trying to draw links, I think, harder. It, it certainly makes sense, but it would by necessity be observational association research and you know how we feel about that sort of thing around here. Yes. Rachel would mm. love to know if there's any good evidence to support or to contradict sleep training for babies. <clears throat> so mm. can babies really learn to self-soothe? And what, of all the, uh, what about all the non-Western cultures who share a bed with their babies? Are those babies and families better off than the sleep training families? Yeah, so sleep with babies is is tough. Um, I have always advocated people to stop having babies because I think humanity should end. Yep. I think it's been a failed experiment, yep. and we should just fade off gracefully into the night, let the doggos have their day. But somehow people just don't listen to you. Indeed. So, yeah, there's not a... I mean, so here's the thing. The, the issue with sleep training for babies is that no matter what you do eventually your baby is going to grow up and sleep through the night so you're hopefully hopefully yeah um there isn't a lot of research there was one study i found published in jama like an actual randomized controlled trial where they randomized the parents obviously to sort of like either a control group or two types of sleep training graduated extinction and then bedtime fading so I'll explain briefly what those mm -hmm. are. Graduated extinction is when you sort of extend the amount of time between when you go into the baby, so you let them cry for one minute, and the next time they cry, you let them cry for three minutes and five minutes. It's just like ten. training a dog. Yeah. <clears throat> so that's graduated extinction. The other time is bedtime fading, where if the baby doesn't fall asleep right away when you put them in the crib, if it takes them more than 15 minutes, you put them to sleep half an hour later, and then you keep moving their mm -hmm. bedtime okay. so that... So they're, they're, they're sleepier. sleepier. Yeah, they're sleepier. Yeah. So you try to find the appropriate bedtime for that baby. Okay. Um, so those are two methods. The, now, the mean age of the babies in this study was 10 months. So they were already like older-ish, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can do whatever you want with like an infant. They, they are not self-aware enough to understand cause and effect in the outside world, right? 
So um, it, it did make a difference. The difference was small. The increase in sleep time with both of these techniques was 12 and 15 minutes on average. Okay. So, you know, you can decide if that was a lot or not. I mean, the concern that people have is, are you stressing the baby out by having them cry? Is that creating a cortisol surge hmm. that is going to have negative health implications? And according to this one study in pediatrics, no. What was interesting too is that by one year, at, so this was sort of the initial study period, mm -hmm. at one year follow-up, there was no difference between the groups. Hmm. So sleep training is kind of one of those things that does it work? Maybe a little. It's probably not going to have any long-lasting implications because no matter what you do, eventually your baby is going to right. grow up and have a normal sleep schedule. So One would hope so. One would hope so. In terms of sleeping with your baby, I mean, the recommendations here are not to co-sleep with your baby to avoid SIDS, mm -hmm. sudden infant death syndrome. And I think that's pretty clear. When you look at other cultures, you have to bear in mind that they are often sleeping differently. They are sleeping on different types of mattresses. A lot of them are, are sleeping on floors rather yeah. than beds. They don't have like the fluffy mattresses with blankets. And that really seems to be a risk factor for SIDS as well. So mm. I think it's a hard thing to tease out. Um, you know, maybe one of these days we'll get Clay back on the show and he can give us some more detailed analysis of this. But overall, it seems as if sleep training, if it has a benefit, it's a small one up to you to decide if it's, you know, that f extra 15 minutes is, is worth it or not. Dr. Clay Jones, yes. Um, Nolan asks, is there a significant difference between medical grade salt for a nasal rinse and just regular table salt? So <clears throat> I've tried both. And in my first-hand experience, because as you know, anecdotal experience is critically it's important. It's the best, yeah. Um, it's at the I, top of the pyramid of evidence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I haven't um, seen a difference. The, the, the rationale for using the packet they provide you is that you know that you're going to mix the right amount of salt and the right amount of water because you have the fixed little bottle yeah. or cylinder or whatever. Mm -hmm. the, the reason to put salt in, have you ever tried to put just fresh water? Up your nose. Have you ever tried that? Uh, well, <clears throat> well, yeah, in the pool, accidentally. Yeah, uh, it irritates your it's airways. It's extremely, it's, not fun. it's extremely unpleasant. Yeah. So the <laughs> reason to put salt is if you just put fresh water, just plain tap water, uh, it's going to irritate your. So your you want to create an isotonic solution. Exactly, and so you want to have the right thing. The actual instructions, if you wanted to make your own, are three teaspoons of iodide-free salt combined with one teaspoon of baking soda. Mm -hmm. That's from the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. Um, I didn't know about the baking soda thing. Apparently, it's less irritating. Yeah, I've read about that as well. Yeah. I don't know how true it is, but yeah. I mean, I've tried just regular salt, and I'm fine. Okay. Because I do use nasal rinses occasionally. Mm -hmm. I don't know that they make much of a difference, but sometimes yeah, no, they help a little. I'm, I'm doing it right now because of my cough, and it seems to be drying out my airways, which is a good thing. Yeah. But I have to do it a lot, like four times a day. Yeah. So, um, yeah, is it, does it make a difference? No, it's really about convenience, about giving people a simple thing, which is take this much, take this packet, put it into this much water where the black line on the bottle is, mm -hmm. and this way you don't um, misdose yourself. That was the rationale behind these, um, you know, Pedialyte and these other rehydration solutions right. for babies. You could, in theory, just make it yourself at home yeah, with the right amount convenient. of salt and sugar. It's convenient. Also, sometimes people make mistakes. Yeah. And you have babies coming in with either dehydration or because they had too much salt. or hmm. too, So, it, like, mistakes do happen. And so, again, you're paying for convenience. Deb asks, my sister is taking Ceylon cinnamon. I'm guessing it's, it's <clears> another <throat> word for Sri Lanka. Um, well, maybe it has to do with maybe maybe it has to do with uh, Battlestar Galactica, not Cylon, Cylon. but Ceylon. Maybe. Uh, cinnamon capsules in large doses because she swears it makes her A one C go down significantly. And there was a family history of type two diabetes. Is there any data supporting this? We have mentioned A one C in the past, but just yeah. as a refresher. So a hemoglobin A one C is a blood test that you do. It measures the amount of sugar on your hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is what's on red blood cells that carries oxygen. Mm -hmm. And so by looking at the percentage of sugar there, you can get a sense of what people's uh, diabetes control is. So rather than okay. checking your fingers all the time. Right. You, you can, can do this once every three months? It's it? once, yeah, it gives you about a three-month average. Right. There's only one circumstance in which it's inaccurate. Do you want to take a guess as when it oh, is? God, you always ask us I this know. kind of question. Like, yeah. well, but there's an exception. Yeah. What if you're dead? <laughs> what if you're dead? <laughs> what um, if you were abducted by the Cylons? <clears throat> yeah. Um, what, what if you are a Cylon? <laughs> what if you have anemia? No. No, I don't know. It's if you got a blood transfusion. 
Oh, because right. the red blood cells are not your own. Right. So that's the one circumstance where it wouldn't be uh, accurate. Mm-hmm. So it's um, it, 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 I, I thought this was going to be one of those things where ah, this is just like nonsense. There's actually, you know, a fair amount of studies that have been done looking at cinnamon to see if it makes a difference. Mm-hmm. There is a Cochrane review on it. So when okay. in doubt, turn to the argument. In the end, it doesn't seem to make much of a difference. Huh, I think okay. people can l- hang their hat on like some positive studies but then there's also some negative studies and overall it seems not to make a huge difference so Mm. is it having an effect if it has an effect it's probably very very small and if you actually have diabetes you're much better off taking some of the truly truly effective medications that exist on the market which can really get your diabetes under control you know again i i hesitate to be one of these people like well if it works for you (laughs) um but i think the 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 weight of the evidence is that it doesn't do much and, and and it has been studied quite a bit Sky wants to know what's the deal with night sweats. What's the deal with what's night sweats? What's the deal with night sweats? Do we have any idea why they happen or how to be less likely to have them? Since my mid thirties, it's very common that I'll basically have to towel off at some mm. point in the night, which mm. is kind of gross. Well, I won't be sharing a bed with you, Sky. <laughs> That's sorry about that. Um, well, look, people sweat for all kinds of reasons. Um, when you approach this problem medically, you want to look for a medical cause, so hyperthyroidism, uh, okay. so your thyroid uh, acting overactive, overactive, because mm-hmm. uh, that contributes to thermal regulation. When people complain about this, what we often look for is you're looking for a hidden cause, so infection, especially hidden infections. Right, if, like if you have a fever, you're going to be sweating a lot. Exactly, and the other one is uh, malignancy. So we are not diagnosing you with cancer, Sky. No, that is not what Chris is saying. No, but the symptom of night sweats is typically referred to as one of the B symptoms of malignancy and is mm. also used for a thing. And it's a consequence of the tumor releasing inflammatory markers. So oh, you want to check for these things. The reality is, though, is some people just sweat a lot. And I mean, there's often sometimes more benign explanations like um, menopause. Right. Right. Especially if you're you know, a woman of the right age. What about andropause? <clears throat> andropause is not a real medical problem. But, um, yeah, this kind of happens. And what, what, what often is the issue here is that you have two people living together, yep. right? Because nobody wants to die alone. One of them is always hot, the other one one's is always, always cold. cold. Right. And that's because different people have different, you know, set points for lack of a better term, right? So if you were by yourself, you would have a thin bed sheet and you'd have the window open and you'd be fine. But because yeah. you're trying to accommodate the other person, one person is always going to be a little bit uncomfortable. So what we have to do is go back to the old separate British bedrooms. Tradition, separate bedrooms. <laughs> but no, yeah. it just, it happens. I mean, there are treatments for hyperhidrosis, if that's the thing. It's a question of whether you want to start doing it. Uh, they're not, you know, they so are. There are, there are side effects to, to those. There are side yeah. effects. To, you know, the, you can do stuff. But as a general rule, if it doesn't bother you too much, just, you know, open a window and maybe two different blankets for the people you share that with. Nolan asks, are you familiar with not using <clears throat> shampoo and minimal soap? Mm-hmm. And he refers to it as pits and bits. Yeah. So basically <laughs> just soaping your armpits yes. and your, your and genitals. Growing, yeah. In, uh, in the shower, so just <clears throat> using soap to wash your hands. You said to use a mild soap for your face in the acne episode, but really you could just skip it altogether. Yeah, you could, and that's fair. Um, Here's the thing. You don't have to wash yourself every day. I mean, there's no medical reason why you have to bathe on a daily basis. Mm. You know, go back to the Middle Ages. People would bathe once a week, and they were fine with it. Yeah, well, if we were time traveling back there, I'm sure we have some olfactory problems. (laughs) Well, here's the thing. The reason why we bathe every day is because we want to. We like to smell nice, but Mm -hmm. there's no inherent medical reason. And, of course, people who have skin conditions... Um, like eczema, for example. I mean, yeah, there is an argument for not exposing your skin to irritating soap. And I think right. the comment about, you know, you could just not wash your face altogether. Yeah, that's that's fair as well because you don't want to irritate it. So, you know, could you just wash the parts that sweat? Yeah, and there are people who say that. I mean, you know, I take a shower every day, but, you know, there's many people who don't wash their hair every day, right? A lot of women don't just because of the... You know, how expensive shampoo is well yeah and the, <laughs> number you know, one yeah and the time it takes to blow dry your hair afterwards like there's you know again right. so you know you don't have to so i'm gonna stop showering okay and we'll I, see and we'll see what happens if we still have a podcast in yeah. three months have you heard of people who like have stopped using shampoos their hair gets really gross for a while but then it, the natural oil production starts up again and then they're just fine with it and they just stop washing their hair yeah, I mean, it's a question of taste. I mean, you know, if you're fine, if you if you are fine with it, and the people around you are fine with it, like nothing's gonna happen to you medically if you don't shower. You just, you know, 
you'll smell a little ripe. <laughs> Brian and Terry ask, when does flawed research become fraud research or fraudulent mm. research? Journals publish follow-up corrections such as, you know, incorrect study yeah. dates and author affiliation or error in methods results in table two, which is one thing and seems completely acceptable and necessary. But how much or how often can an author claim, oops, mm. for example, Dan Ariely? Right. I mean, yeah. I mean, mistakes happen. And especially if you've ever participated in a scientific paper, you realize that by the end of it, you have like a dozen people. Everybody's making corrections. Nobody's keeping track of, you know, what the final version of the document is. Final, final two, final. doc, doc. Yeah. And it's like, wait, did we fix that? Like what's going And uh -huh. it's, you know, so yeah, mistakes do happen. Again, if they're like typographical, you know, somebody's moved their jobs and now they want to be affiliated with something else or that's understandable. Yeah, yeah. That's understandable stuff. I mean, like where is a line into fraud? I think it's very subjective, right? If it's consistent, if it's the same person, again, if the errors were random, they would be random, right? Some of them would work in your favor. Some of them were, would work against you when the errors are consistently turning null results into sexy results. Then I think you have a problem. And when your, uh, when your results or when your table of results, contains numbers that are impossible right that are not random looking yeah that's an indication that it's probably fraudulent right and i think there are ways to check about this with you know you, there are mathematical tests that you can do to see if something is explainable by random chance or mm -hmm. does it look like they were deliberately fabricated this was back in the olden days before computers they used to have these tables of logarithms that you would like search in books <sighs> to find right. the things and one of the ways that they found that there was fraud or one of the ways they realize that there is this very clear distribution where random numbers tend to begin with the number one. Mm -hmm. There's a name for it. I forget what it's called. Yeah, right you now. mentioned this before. It's that in this book, they would see like the first two pages were always like very smudged. And then the, <laughs> the last pages that had all the eights and nines in it were barely touched. And that's I because see. in, in, in uh, natural systems, um, random values tend to begin with one or two. And then the frequency of like three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine tends to taper off. Strange. Okay. <clears throat> uh, David asks, I've seen conflicting opinions about how to reduce your cholesterol levels by eating less of certain foods. Mm. Is reducing dietary cholesterol effective in reducing cholesterol mm. levels in your blood? And if so, what is the best way to do that? Um, dietary cholesterol tends not to have a huge impact on the cholesterol levels in your blood. It does a little bit and it's you know, going to vary person to person. So can we just like eat as much cholesterol as we want to? A lot of it is genetic. Hmm. A lot of it is generic. So for a lot of people, if you have very high cholesterol, changing your diet is not going to change anything. You really need to inhibit the enzyme that is synthesizing cholesterol in your liver and inside your body. Okay. So, um, but it, you know, there is some contribution to dietary cholesterol the the place where we get most of our dietary cholesterol from do you want to guess which food it is well i would guess it's 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 meat and it meat, is meat, meat yeah. products yeah yeah, yeah mm -hmm. it's meat that's where most of it comes from a lot of people think eggs and there is you know a fair amount of cholesterol in eggs but mm -hmm. most of the cholesterol we eat comes from eating meat so if you wanted to cut the cholesterol in your diet meat and then other things like eggs probably would be most important but a lot of it is genetic and especially if you're part of certain ethnic groups, there's a lot of genetic cholesterol here in Quebec because of a founder effect. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot Meaning of... Meaning that we had some people come over from France. Yeah. There were very few of them. Yeah. They started uh, interbreeding. Yeah. And uh, that means that those mutations are more prevalent. Mm -hmm. And so they, they, we have descendants now who have those mutations that, were, that came, came about because these, these, a small number of people were, were breeding with each other. Right. So there is a genetic... Um, there's a, there's a fairly strong genetic co contribution to cholesterol, in which case your diet is not really going to affect anything. Now, it's not to say that you should go and eat a four egg omelet for breakfast every day, but, um, for the vast majority of people, what I usually tell them is, listen, do a trial of diet and lifestyle change, see if it does anything. And, it, and if it doesn't come then, back and see me and I'll yeah. prescribe you a statin. That's right. Yeah. Because they do, they do work. Shill, yeah. shill, pharmaceutical shill. <laughs> Except all the statins are off patent now, and they are like essentially dirt all cheap. of them. Yeah, they're all off patent. Okay. There's not a single one that's not because they're so they're like they're all years old at this point. Yeah. David asks, "What are your thoughts on the placebo effect? Is it a real thing?" So get ready because mm -hmm. we've got about a half hour to talk about the placebo <laughs> effect. Um, I mean, is it a real thing? Yeah, it's a real thing. It's not. It's not one thing. 
Yeah. It's, it's, it's a combination of phenomena that are all playing off of each other. The placebo effect is a shorthand that we use to denote a bunch of things, which is spontaneous remission, regression to the mean, um, you know, and some desire to please the experimenter, right. the, and, the, the white lab coat effect. Yeah. Or... And a certain thing that, you know, we are prone to the power of suggestion. So if you tell somebody, I'm going to treat you now, they will subjectively feel better, right? Yeah. The Hawthorne effect, which is a whole thing. Which like, we shouldn't call the Hawthorne effect. effect yeah. the, anyway, but yeah. Yeah. But I mean, again, these are shorthands for very complex these are non phenomenon. non-specific effects that make it look as if you have improved after yeah. after undergoing an intervention, but it was not the intervention itself right. that caused the improvement. Yeah, and I mean this comes up because there was this thing. I, don't, I did a radio segment about this about these the new super patches. I don't know if you saw this in the media. They were big in the no. French media here. Super patches. Yeah, they're called super patches, and they were okay. like, and it's like the pharmacy the pharmacy association was warning against them, where they were interviewed by somebody. Or the, there's like things that you stick on yeah. your skin. Yeah, stick and they're like, we and treat what's in there. They, they 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 won't say. Okay, it's a proprietary thing, so we don't. Okay. They don't say, but it's all natural. Uh huh. And it's like it can treat obesity and also chronic oh, arthritis God. and also ADHD. And it's like, and then so the question became: is like, well, if could it just be the placebo effect? I'm like, well, I mean, yeah, some of it. And then I'm like, well, then is that bad if people feel better? And like, it's an it's because the thing is that problem. researchers use the phrase placebo effect yeah. to mean one thing. Yeah. The average person uses it to mean the mind healing the body. Yeah. And there might be a residual mind over body effect in some cases for example with pain with nausea right but you can just look at yeah the placebo arm of a trial and be like that is all the mind healing the body no 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 it's a bunch of non-specific effects yeah. that have just to do with like the natural course of the illness etc cetera, etc cetera. and so when you once you remove all of this there might be some mind healing the body stuff left over there might not be it's hard to tell it's right yeah so anyways, we, we keep saying we're going to do a whole episode on the placebo effect and maybe we will get to it. Yeah, because it's, I mean... You know, it's so complicated. If Yeah, if you really care about this, go watch Mike Hall's QED talk about the placebo effect on YouTube. Uh, very, very good. Highly recommended. Yeah. And, and, fun. and when probably like, the problem is that a lot of the things that we say about the placebo effect, about red pills and blue pills and about injections, things, not true. Yeah, a lot of them have become folklore that yep. don't really seem to have an actual basis in... That whole chapter in uh, Ben Goldacre's Bad Science about the placebo effect is riddled yeah. with like misremembered studies. Yeah. And he was he, like, he did a really poor job of representing what we know about the placebo effect. So yeah, there's a lot of this, these truisms that are unfortunately not true. And finally, in that section, Nolan Sun asks, can you sneeze while sleeping? If you believe enough. <laughs> yes, you can. I mean, I, well, I, 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 so you have a nice little quote here from the Sleep Foundation. Yes. I mean, why don't you read it? Well, here we go. I'll read a thing. So, generally believed you can't sneeze during REM sleep because your muscles are paralyzed. In other stages, in other sleep stages, sneezing may require at least partial awakening, but there is not enough evidence to rule out the possibility that sneezing can occur during later stages of sleep. So, I mean, as a general rule, no. But then again, if you're just not quite asleep but kind of asleep could you be awake enough that you can do it i mean yeah it's possible but as a general if somebody asks you and you have to pick yes or no say no or probably not <laughs> myth busted <laughs> myth busted and now on to the more personal questions which Ra is what which is what you all came for which is what you all came for we made you wait mm -hmm. this far into the podcast rachel wants to know what is your favorite spot in montreal to eat poutine I don't eat poutine that often because I choose life. Um, <laughs> right. But, you know, if somebody's like in from out of town or whatever, like where, where do you go? La Banquise, I guess, is the most famous one. Yeah, that's where we went with Ryan Armstrong oh, that's right. uh, yeah. five years ago for after the McGill event. Yeah, yeah I mean, it, it, parking is, is challenging, um, yeah. but it is good. It's the most famous one, right? So, yeah, follow, you know, lack of, uh, yeah. For, pe for people who don't, uh, know what poutine is? Mm. Can you describe this de this Quebec delicacy? Uh, French fries with cheese and gravy. Cheese curds, right? Cheese curds and gravy. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's you know heartwarming, not especially healthy. <laughs> no. Uh, but it is a very much. Speaking a of cholesterol, how how much cholesterol is is in the typical poutine? Probably oh, well, probably a lot, a fair amount, a yeah. fair amount. But yeah, it is uh it is uh, comfort food, shall we say? Indeed. Not not especially good for you. 
Do you, do you eat poutine? I do not eat poutine. No, no. I yeah. do love French fries, yeah. but uh, if you throw gravy and cheese curds on top, it's a bit I'm, much. I'm, I'm gonna it's, say it's no. very heavy, and uh, yeah, I don't I don't eat it very often. When I do, that tends to be the place where I will go. So the answer is La Banquise. Mm. Mary Ellen asks, I, I'm a retired family doctor in Calgary without my own family doctor. Welcome to the future, everyone. <laughs> I'm wondering if either or both of you have a family doctor, and if so, how long it takes to get an appointment? And if not, how, you, how do you access healthcare? Love the work that you both do. Thank you, Mary Ellen. I appreciate that. Um, I do have a family doctor. It's the same family doctor that I've had uh, all my life. Um, wow, same fam- that's lucky. Yeah, same family doctor that my parents have and most of my family is there. I don't know how long before he retires, uh, maybe soon. At which if, point- if they retire, because as you, as you yourself know, a lot of doctors just never retire. Yeah, they just keep going. And yeah. I, to be fair, a lot of them do it because they feel bad for their, their patients. Mm. And they're like, if I retire, who do I give it up to? It used to be that when you retired, you could sell your medical practice. Oh, wow. It was like a small business. Like you could right. sell it to a new physician who wanted to establish themselves. Huh. Now you can't give it away. Hmm. Um, so yeah, it's, um, it's a challenge. Um, I mean, it's, it's easy for me to access the healthcare system because I can just contact my colleagues, but it's becoming increasingly problematic for a lot of people. And I wish I had a solution. Um, it's, we're getting to the point where you have to start leveraging connections and calling people, you know, and calling in favors because otherwise it's not easy. It's really bad. For the longest time, I did not have a family doctor. I would go to, uh, random clinics back when we had walk-in clinics that were actually walk-in clinics. Now you have to make an appointment at walk-in clinics. Uh, when I was working at the Jewish General Hospital, we had one hour every day, there was a clinic for the employees. Mm -hmm. So that was very useful. I could go see that doctor who would, um, not even look at you and like let mm. you speak for about 10 seconds before whipping out a prescription on this pad mm. and I get, get out of my office. But at least, you know, it was, it was access. It was something. Uh, and now the reason why I have a family doctor is because I know somebody mm. who knows somebody in that clinic and that's how I managed to, once again, it's about connections. Yeah. And even there, um, I can't see my doctor uh, within, you know, six weeks or so because mm. he's booked. Uh, but they do have a, an urgent care clinic mm. at that family clinic and I had to go there recently, and I could not make an appointment. Yeah. It was completely full, yeah. and I had to go through you. Yeah. So that is the Mad Max apocalyptic yeah. uh, scenario that we are facing now here in Quebec, where, where medicine is extremely hard to access. I wonder if 20, 30 years from now, we're going to speak about having your own personal doctor. Yeah, remember those days. There. Grandma, what? What are you saying? It's this like madness. It's like, like Downton Abbey. Like, I had a valet. I had a valet <laughs> right. that yes. would come and dress me. <laughs> exactly. He would go and he would wash my clothes and he would get me clothes and he was in charge of my wardrobe and he would dress me and I'm like, oh, okay. That, that type of personalized service does not exist anymore. <laughs> or like having a travel agent. Like, you wanted to travel. Yes. I would I, like I to go to Paris, yeah. please. Let me know when you've sorted it out. Click. Yep. Um, yeah, so I, I don't, I don't know what the future holds. <laughs> the future will be, you know, when I was young, we used to have a thing called medicine. And yeah. <laughs> People would get screened for disease. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not anymore. Uh, Nolan asks, which guests would you love to have on the show? But they've declined your requests. There have been so many. Yeah. Well, well, it, it, sometimes it's not that the request has been denied. It's, it just hasn't been answered. Yeah. They just don't answer their, their messages. Because uh, we- people don't answer emails anymore. That's, that's the world we live in. People don't answer emails. Yeah, we reached out to uh, Dr. Nicola Gass a year ago. She mm-hmm. was recommended to us to talk about diabetes remission. We never heard back. Uh, we also emailed Dr. Christy Sutherland in Vancouver. Uh, she provides fentanyl to drug users. She was interviewed by the CBC about how doctors can think about harm reduction with drug users. We thought we'd love to discuss this with her. Never heard back. Um, but also, we were trying to get a pharmacist yeah. on the show. Yeah, so, wow. and so much. A bunch as, of dead ends. Yeah, like just it's really hard. Um, some people seem to think that coming on a on a podcast requires them to do like a three month yeah. uh, sabbatical, yeah. uh, uh, like intensive study yeah. uh, away from work, and others just can't be bothered. I guess. Yeah, it's it's it's. I wish I understood how people think, but I don't. But I don't, and that's why you I should think, have gone into human psychology. I mean, it's. <laughs> I yeah, I don't understand. I mean, are are people more protective of their time than they used to be, and they don't want to do something that isn't part of their job because or they worry about the pushback that they're going to get, the hate I mean, mail. Yeah, you know, I, mean, I don't know. I know. I feel most of the stuff we do is fairly non-controversial, but there you there you go. Nolan asks, which episodes surprise you with very high 
or very low downloads slash listens. I'm always surprised that we exist. <laughs> I mean, our analytics are, yeah, are fairly, fairly stable. stable. Yeah. I do have to say that, unfortunately, our sports science miniseries uh, kind of underperformed, and I just don't know why. I was yeah. super proud of it. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, fewer people than usual listen to episodes two, three, and four. Yeah. So that's a thing that happens sometimes. You, tr- you experiment, you try different things, yeah. and your audience is like, no, we don't like that. Remember that pilot episode about vitamins? Yeah. Oh, they didn't like that they one. They did not like that one. <laughs> so they did not like happens. that music. They did yeah. not like that music. I can't hear anything. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> Try I, headphones. It's always weird. Like, you never really know. Like, sometimes I do something. I'm like, this is going to be silly. No one will care. Like, right. I did one thing where, you know, where does weight go when you lose weight? Do you remember that one? Well, you did ask and, that question to uh, to the host of our sports uh, science mini series, and I did whisper to her the yeah, answer. Yeah. It's like, ah, ah, yeah, just so you exhale it. <laughs> but we no, I did it with uh, Mitsumi Takahashi for CTV also, okay. News originally. Okay, this was like a while back, and the answer is you breathe it off, right? You lose yeah. the carbon, CO2. carbon dioxide, and people just the entire, kept talking the about it. Newsroom was like. What? Breaking news, but breaking then, news. But then the following day, like different radio stations were really? talking about it. Yes. I wow. think you had heard it and you texted me and then I yeah. saw it online. Well, Veritas had made a video about it on mm. YouTube uh, many, many years ago, which I, I didn't know. And then we, when he explained, I was like, oh, yeah, that, that, of course, mm. that makes sense. But yeah, I can imagine that a lot of people would just, they would think it comes out uh, through your sweat. Or they would think like you burn it, like you're losing it as heat. Right, right. Because we, we speak that way, right? We burn, yeah, you burn your fat. fat. Yeah. But you're not real. Like where you can't convert mass into energy. Otherwise, you'd be a nuclear reactor. But E equals MC squared. Yes. If, if you're the sun, maybe. <laughs> yeah. So like stuff like that. And like people kept talking about it. I wrote an article about um, mammograms and mammogram screening. And mm-hmm. I was like, wow, that got like a lot of attention. And I was like, mm. why? And I think people were just arguing about what's the age for screening, right? Like, at what age do you start screening mammograms? And I was right. explaining, like, you know, the problem is that the younger you go, the less accurate you become. So there's this trade-off in false positives. Right. So there's no real cutoff. It's just a sliding scale. And man, that just, like, you know, took off. And I was like, I did not think that was going to be as interesting a topic as it was because I thought hmm. it was fairly conventional. So you, you, it's really hard to predict what is going to be of interest to people and what won't. One episode that did really well, again, for no seemingly logical reason, is our analysis of the healthcare system. Remember we did that as a summer episode. Right. I vaguely remember, yeah. yeah. It was yeah. a special episode. Yeah, okay. and it did like really well. Okay. And people were like, people wanted to know how the healthcare system works. So Well, because yeah. they're trying to access yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> Nolan also asked which episode or sketch took the most re-records. Uh, well, so certainly like our early episodes, they, they took more takes and yeah. we had a bunch of bloopers. We just weren't very good at it we got better at it over time now there's hardly any blooper left on the cutting room floor yeah i mean there's little edits about like coughing and like yeah stuff like that but yeah no i mean we usually did everything in one take i mean sometimes sometimes we would redo it just to be sure or we would try things especially if we had to be like away from the microphone but overall i mean most things we did pretty we never did like five takes no 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 uh, the one that we had to practice before, I remember singing Dementia Pugilistica. Yes, uh, in, in the Lion King yeah. fashion. Do you want to do it? Dementia. No, no, it's, it's not oh, yes. Dementia, Dementia Pugilistica. Pugilistica. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we did, we did do that. Uh, Nolan also asked, yeah, I ask a lot of questions. Mm, yeah. What are, <laughs> that's very, very specific. What are four things you wish you were spending time on instead of the podcast? And what are three motivators to keep you doing this instead? Yeah. The, the money. The money. No oh, yes. The money. Um, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I, I wish I had more time to just read and watch more TV and movies and just mm. relax instead of working consistently. You, although, lazy, you lazy bum. <laughs> although I, I do have to say, like in the last six months, I have been taking it easier. We, I do less editing on the podcast mm. now. Uh, so that has freed me up quite a bit. Uh, but what about you? Um, I, uh, I'm going to spontaneously combust, uh, very, very soon. Uh, it's cause I don't like not doing anything. I like doing stuff. Right. I like doing stuff. I mean, let me take the questions in, in reverse order. Like okay. what, what motivates me to keep doing it? Mm-hmm. Um, a sense of, uh, a sense of urgency, <laughs> a sense, a sense of, of urgency. Uh-huh. 
the fact that I cannot be left alone with my own thoughts. Right. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, why, like, why, like, why do we keep doing this podcast? Because uh, because people like it and people ask us questions and we have fans. So I'm like, you know what? Let's let's do it. And if we can do it and we have the capacity to do it, and you know, we don't have to rely on this financially. No. Because thank know, goodness, thank don't. goodness, because we'd be very poor. Yep. Um, you know, we do it, and again, I think it is important to push back against the darkness. Uh, so I think it's important to do whatever you can do, and uh, I, I still remain somewhat hopeful because it's always darkest before the dawn. And uh, as we as we know for the dark night. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Um, uh, what, that great work yeah. of philosophy, the dark night. What what would I want to spend time? I mean, I I do. Uh, I mean, I, you do have a girlfriend now. I do have a girlfriend now. Um, <laughs> and we go. <laughs> it sounded like you're like. <sighs> you imagine how now? <laughs> somebody posted this photo on YouTube or uh, YouTube on Twitter or some of the social media things. Uh-huh. Like wrote a book, and the dedication was this book is dedicated to my family without whom this book would have been completed two years earlier. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> Burn. <clears throat> um, no, I mean, look, I like writing. I would like to write another book. Uh, we'll see if we can make that happen. Um, the book industry is interesting in Canada right now, and one day I'll... It is also it. slowly collapsing, much like the healthcare system. Much like the healthcare system. <laughs> Everything is collapsing. Well, look, soon we will just all be reading... Uh, the Prince Harry biography and Britney Spears' memoirs. Yes. And that'll be literature. Yes. And a century from now, people will look back on this and be like, what was this fascination with biography? I, of believe, the late that, I believe there was a movie made about this. Uh, Idiocracy? Idiocracy. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, we're, we're getting there, people. We're, we're getting there. We, I mean, go back and watch what was once absurd satire, the idea that a reality TV star could become president. I mean, you know, there was Ronald Reagan, who was an actor before becoming president, but this is like taking this to the next level. Yeah, I mean, Ronald Reagan, I mean, listen, there has been there have been a lot of actors like Sonny Bono, and they, but they, they had careers in, polit- mm-hmm. in politics, right? right? It's not like... They didn't wake up when they'd be like, no. I'm running for president Yeah, now. exactly. You know, he, he was governor. He, like, he, he had like decades of experience, regardless of what you think of Ronald mm-hmm. Reagan. Or even like Sonny Bono, like people would make fun of Sonny Bono. He had a very long career, I think a fairly long career in Congress, right? I'm not familiar with Sonny Bono. Oh, really? I mean, I, I, Sonny and Cher. Oh, I didn't know that he was yeah. a politician as yeah, well. Yeah, he was a oh, congressman. Okay. Okay. He was a congressman. Oh, and he, wow. he died, died young. He died in a skiing accident. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, it was quite tragic. All right. Um, but yeah, so, and, and um, the guy from Saturday Night Live. Uh, Which one? Yeah, the one who became a, also became a congressman. Oh, oh, yes. Uh, a Democrat who had to apologize he, yeah. as he stepped down. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, with the glasses. I forget his name. I yes. forget his name, too. So, yeah. I mean, again, I have no objection to people switching careers mm-hmm. if that becomes their new career. But, I mean, this, the current situation is just, like, radically different. Anyways, um, why do we start talking about politicians? Because the dark night. The dark it's night. It's always darkest right. before the dawn. Idiocracy. We were saying yes. they were slowly getting to the point. Yeah. It's, it's, it's really kind of scary. Um, I, I look up I look at blue sky like every morning when I mm, wake up mm. and I, just, I can't believe half of the headlines. Mm. Like, yeah. Like now now it's like if you get onto a Boeing airplane, mm. who knows what's going to happen? Mm. <laughs> no, sometimes planes crash. That's just <laughs> the new reality we live in. Sometimes bolts are a little too loose. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. So, right. All this was about what I like to do. Yeah, I'd like to write another book. I wish we had time to do more video stuff. I, cause it, it's because yeah. I would do it. It seemed I I do stuff because it seems fun, and right. I would do it if it would seem fun. It's the labor intensiveness, and it's yes. how to do it well. And, and we're, we're going to get so few views. I mean, we're we're going to experiment with, with video, and we have a, quite a few things in mind yeah. Uh, yeah. later this year. But yeah, it's it's a question of how could we do it for fun without it sucking up a lot of time yeah. and you know making it look good because we don't yeah. want to do something that looks terrible either yeah. but anyways we're we try sp- that <laughs> we're, ex- we're experimenting with stuff i don't know i mean i think it's anyways we'll we'll talk about this some more off 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 microphone off Indeed. camera and if you have ideas you can send them to us and i think we did get a few suggestions yes. from people but we should try to do short stuff just because it is funny and it's a different platform and youtube has certain advantages beyond podcasting because podcasting is not an inherently shareable yeah. platform yeah. which is a, a a difficulty when you're trying to grow nolan asks which of you can eat the hottest peppers uh, it's sus- probably you i suspect it's me yeah, yeah. I'm, i don't tolerate uh, mm. spiciness uh, very well yeah I, I don't i'm not a big fan of spicy food but i i, I do eat it occasionally um, my partner in life uh, got some very spicy mustard, and it was like it's very spicy, but it's like oh, this is an interesting change. I'm okay with it. So yeah, <laughs> I'm sure it's definitely me. 
Sky asks, can I buy you a beverage next time I'm in Montreal? No. If you're not too sweaty. No, the, it's on me, Sky. If you if come to Montreal, it's on me. Paul asks, what brought you to this flavor of scientific skepticism? How did you come to work together? Did you know each other beforehand? Did you both grow up in Montreal? Why do the Habs suck? Because of capitalism. Because so of that, capitalism, Paul. The Habs, of course, of the Montreal Canadiens uh, hockey team. Do you want to explain I, where the word Habs comes from? Well, I always thought yeah. that it was short for habitant. Yeah, me too. Uh, but it's not. It's, yeah. Uh, so habitant is a word that refers to the early uh, colonizers who were coming here who were establishing like farms. Mm-hmm. It basically means like somebody from the countryside. Mm-hmm. It has this, this implication that you're not very well educated. Uh, well, now, I mean, the word yes. itself just means I live here. Yes. Yeah, but it became, it had this connotation. Kind of like dweller. Yeah. Uh, but no, that is not what Habs refers to. The first man to refer to the team as the Habs was apparently the American Tex Rickard, owner of the Madison Squares Garden in 1924. And he thought that the H on the sweater was for habitant, uh, but it was not. Mm. And the nickname dates back to at least 1914, actually. It was printed in a local newspaper here called The Devoir. And so it's, it's a little bit kind of lost uh, in time why this association, but that is not uh, what, what ABS refers to. That's not what the H on the uh, jersey refers to, but that's like the common folklore now is that it, they used to be called yeah. Les Habitants, yeah. but they never were. Apparently. No, they never were because the H stands for hockey. Right? Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. It stands for hockey. And the word Canadien was how the people in Quebec used to refer to themselves, mm-hmm. right? They were the Canadiens. Before, before Toronto was a thing. <laughs> before Toronto was a thing. But no, they would refer to themselves as Canadien and the others were, you know, the others. And then Canadi- Canadian came to apply to the entire country and then all the right. provinces had their own thing. But yeah, so it's, it's an interesting... I keep saying that we should become a... Uh, word etiology yes. history of words podcast and a gilmore girls and rewatch a gilmore podcast, podcast. Yeah. yeah we'll we'll do both of those things so how how did we come to work together chris well we met uh fighting in vietnam uh, <laughs> yes yes famously so we we had this idea With once of Teddy. doing yeah we had this idea once of doing like this fake documentary <laughs> yes. about like how we met that was just like absurd it would have taken like days to put together yeah. and we would have received very very few listens <laughs> uh just just for the sake of it i think we would have done it we, we were going to do it as like a christmas special and yep. then the end of the year is always such a rush time for both of us that we just never did it maybe we yeah. should do it for fun at one point just just for like Silly reasons. I don't know. A Spinal Tap esque uh, yeah. audio mockumentary yeah. of, of of how we met, how we met. During, during the Vietnam War. Yeah, we were on the same platoon. I mean, people ask us like, "Oh, did you guys go to school together? You've been friends for years." And and no, we met. Well, now yes, we've been friends, friends for, for years. years now. But we <laughs> met very randomly. You had emailed me out of the blue yep. and wanted to interview me for the podcast you were doing at the time which was yep. called within reason correct not cracked science indeed As cracked you, science was your moniker it was by the blog that i had uh, for uh, right. it was a blog about science and skepticism back then yeah um so you interviewed me and i was like who is this guy is he like a psycho who's gonna murder me because you're like i want to come to your house and i was like no <laughs> um but then i was like oh okay he's, he's probably not a psychopath he seems legit he seems legit um, and you so set up a number of traps in your in your condo, yeah, yeah. Uh, a la Home Alone, just yeah. in case. I told people, if anything happens to <laughs> yes. me, this is the guy. So you came over because <laughs> you wanted a physician in Montreal to talk about pseudoscience, and there ain't oh, about integrative medicine, medicine specifically. Yeah. yeah, and there aren't many of us doing that sort of thing. And no. I've been writing for the Montreal Gazette, so we did the episode, and it went well. And I was, I think, still living in Toronto then, and I was coming yep. back and forth. Mm-hmm. And so the next time I was back, I said, "Hey, do you want to?" do something because well was... i did email you after the recording <clears throat> yeah uh, and i said i you know i think there's something interesting mm. going on here if you want to do something more than mm. just this one episode with me if there, you have other projects in mind just let me know yeah. and you kind of stewed over it for a while mm. and then you thought oh yeah i've been meaning to do a podcast well i think i didn't have a firm idea but i was like well maybe we could do something right and then i said do you want i think i had said do you want to do a podcast together and you said no, no, no. I'm really busy. I'm too busy. I already have a podcast. <laughs> but then you thought about it a bit, and I think we talked again, and we sort of planned out how it would be. Um, we said, all right, let's give it a shot. And the initial reaction was, like, really positive. Well, I mean, we were <clears throat> kind of lucky because we we did a live recording of the first episode. That's mm. not the, the episode that you will hear when you go up uh, back uh, on our feed. But we also redid that episode live on stage mm-hmm. as part of a show that I was co-hosting. 
and there, and there was Tula Drimonis yeah. who was there, who was on on CJD Radio at the time, mm. and she wanted us on her show yeah. to talk about natural health products, which was a topic yeah. of this episode. And so we ended up on the radio, and we had to rush that first episode out on the feed yeah. because we're like, oh, in a few days we're going to be on the radio, and people are going to be looking for our, our podcast, podcast, and it's yeah. not even out yet. So we got we got kind of lucky in this way that yeah. um, that we got some some early attention. Yeah. And uh, we just kept at it. Yep. And we've just, yeah, we we haven't murdered each other yet. Not yet. Not yet. But One yeah, day. it was it was very much a chance meeting, and yeah. But it, but it, but the reason was because we were both quote unquote putting ourselves out there in the yeah. sense that we were both doing work in that yeah. sphere. And if you don't do that, then nobody knows that you're there, right? And that you're, you know. So if if I hadn't stumbled upon your Montreal Gazette piece, yeah, then yeah. you know. We wouldn't be here today. No, no, really. And um, yeah, it's 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 interesting. It's interesting to think how had any one little thing played out differently, we might not still have you know yeah. the podcast here. So yeah, there's a, a little bit of of uh, kismet. Indeed, Warren asks, "What are your favorite books, both in general and science related?" Apart from the modern classic, Does Coffee Cause Cancer? Of course. Of course. Uh, because it is a modern classic. Actually, you never want to write a classic because you know what Mark Twain said. No, what did he say? A classic is a book that everybody has heard of, but nobody has read. <laughs> That's a good description. Yeah. So yeah. you don't want to write a classic. You want to write a popular book. That's true. You want to write the Britney Spears memoir. <laughs> yes. And you want to be the ghostwriter for that. Here are, here are my recommendations. So for Science and Skepticism, uh, try and find Trick or Treatment by Edson Ernst and Simon Singh. It's the best book about complementary and alternative medicine that I've read. Uh, the Gospel of Wellness by Rena Raphael is extremely good. Uh, Doppelganger by Naomi Klein came out uh, last summer. It is a banger. And the book uh, Conspirituality also is extremely good. Uh, general nonfiction, if you want to see why so much of award-winning modern American fiction is poorly written, uh, track down the book A Reader's Manifesto by B.R. Myers, uh, which was eye-opening to me. It's a tiny little book, mm-hmm. uh, but he criticizes writers like Don DeLillo and Cormac McCarthy, Paul Auster, and others. And he provides long excerpts from their novels, which he very elegantly uh, mm-hmm. criticizes. And once you've read the god-awful sex scene from mm-hmm. Snow Falling on Cedars uh, that he quotes in that book, Your Life Will Change. Really? It's so bad. It mm-hmm. is. It's, it's comical. I'm, I'm, very, I'm very interested now. Uh, in terms of novels... I wrote down a few recommendations. Mm -hmm. Um, If you want a really fun novel about skepticism, uh, check out Stephen Fry's The Hippopotamus. Uh, There's a movie about that, actually, as well. There is, which Mm -hmm. I haven't seen. It's it's good. Okay. Yeah, it's a good movie. The the book is is very funny, very well written. If you want to read uh, two modern science fiction novels that are character-driven and have impeccable dialogue... Uh, read Hank Green's duology, uh, which is uh, an absolutely remarkable thing and a beautifully foolish endeavor. If you want a fantastically well-written gothic, sort of Harry Potter-esque couple of novels, track down the Goldman Gost series by Mervyn Peake. Uh, it's some of the best English writing that I have uh, have ever, ever read. Yeah. Uh, if you want uh, to read a superb character-driven murder, not so mystery, um, that takes place at a uh, fancy college, and that gives you dark academia vibes. Mm. Uh, Donna Tartt's first novel, *The Secret History*, oh, yeah. is really excellent. Yeah, she's an interesting novelist. Her books... I've only read her first okay. novel. There's the other one about oh god, what's the name now? Um, the 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 bird one, the goldfinch. The go- yes, yeah, good book, good book. The movie apparently was not great, right? But uh, the book was was good. Okay, yeah. And my favorite novel of all time, which I've read countless times, mm. uh, and which, funnily enough, was written by one of my favorite film directors, mm. uh, is The Beach. Mm. Uh, first novel by Alex Garland, whose movie Civil War is coming out very soon. Oh, very good. Very good. Yes. All right. How about you, Chris? Um, so I like history. So mm-hmm. if you like history books, anything by John Julius Norwich, especially if you like ancient history. Is and it medieval. Norwich or Norwich? Uh, is, he, is he British? He is British. Okay. It's I think Norwich. Norwich. Okay. There we go. Um, there's another one, uh, The Code Book, which was also written by Simon Singh. Uh, so it's about oh, the history yes. of yes. codes. Yeah, whom we met, whom uh, we met many yeah. years ago when he came to Montreal. Yeah, it was yeah, very yeah. nice. Yeah, yeah. So it was a, if you like history and the history of encoding, and it ends with um, how they broke the... Um, the World War II... Uh, the World War II uh, cipher right. uh, Enigma. Right. With the Enigma machine. With the Enigma machine. Um, if you like Cold War, but there's a book called A Spy Among Friends, uh, which they've also made into a, not Netflix, but an Amazon show. Okay. Is it called A Spy Among Friends? Yeah. 
I haven't heard of it. Okay. Yeah, it's very good. Um, okay. Two great actors in it. Uh, I think Guy Ritchie and Damian Lewis. Oh, okay. Play the two friends in the CIA. One okay. of whom becomes was the Soviet uh, defector. I see. So the Amazon show is like a movie. So it's like a narrative, whereas the book is a more like they're telling the story, like the historical thing behind it. So it's interesting to see how oh, they adapted see. Okay. the show. To they've the, they've to dramatized the it for the, uh, yeah. the TV show. Yeah. Um, and I like, I sometimes I just come across random like biographies, but like older biographies. So I read a book called The Widow Clicquot. Okay. And it's because... As in the Veuve Clicquot? Veuve Clicquot, which yeah. Which is a type of wine, right? Champagne, yes. Champagne, exactly. Okay. And so it's called that because her husband's name was... That's not her name, right? She was widowed. Her husband died and she took over the business. Oh. And it's the story of her and the company, but also champagne, how champagne huh. became popular because it was not a very popular wine. People used to see the bubbles and that was seen as a defect of the, <laughs> uh, the, um, the, the wine making process. Oh, yeah. Okay. But then, then it became popular huh. and anyway, so a lot of stuff. And then anybody who likes history books, uh, an author that I like to read a lot is Eric Larson. He's written books like the splendid and the vile. Okay. And uh, he will often take a historical event like the Chicago world fair and like tie it in with something else like a um, like a murder mystery and you mm. know so very interesting kind of books so cool um if you like novels i like reading robert galbraith who is also known as jk rowling um wait that's one of her pseudonyms yeah Okay. Yeah. She wrote a series of mystery books under the name Robert Galbraith. Okay. Um, and I like them. It's an interesting exercise because, you know, how do you separate the artist from the art? Especially yeah, especially now with <laughs> everything that she said. Yeah. And I, I mean, I guess you could make the argument that maybe we should just stop listening to celebrities and mm -hmm. just let them produce their art and enjoy the art for what it's worth. Right. I mean, you know, go back in history. A lot of the people historically were also very problematic, right? Mm -hmm. But... You know, I, I enjoy the stories. And if you like, you know, fiction, she, she is a good writer. Okay. Um, so, yeah, it's an, inter it's an interesting exercise that I go through in my head. Which is like, how do you sort of go through this? Um, I like the books All Creatures Great and Small. Okay. It's a series of books about uh, a British vet, yeah. Right. And it's sort of a fictionalized version of his life. Okay. Because like, there's a TV show that's been yeah. going on for decades, I think. Well, there's been two. There was an old one from the ah, 70s, and now okay. they're doing a, a reboot now, and okay. it's really good. Um, and it's like a series of books. Oh, Creatures Great and Small. And they're funny, and they're short little stories. I mean, there's no great narrative arc to them. They're mm -hmm. sort of like isolated episodes that are sort of strung Vignettes. together in a loose way. Yeah. Um, Charles Todd is a mother-son mystery writing pair. They've written a series of books, uh, hmm. all based shortly after World War I. And so one of their characters is Ian Rutledge, who's an inspector in, in uh, Scotland Yard who's suffering from shell shock after the war. I see. And he keeps hallucinating the voice of his dead sergeant who's like haunting him. And hmm. so it's, I, uh, they're very nice mysteries. Okay. I like uh, Lee Child. He's written the books on uh, Jack Reacher. Right. That they've made movies and a TV show about. I'm, about, book, I'm about to watch season two now. Uh, yeah, I have to get around to it. I enjoyed season one. I think it was, it was very okay. good. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I really enjoyed it. Um, they, they, are, they are very, especially if you read the books, because he has this hyper-logical mind. And there's mm -hmm. one scene where he's talking to somebody who's like a profiler for the FBI. <laughs> And she was like, you know, I solved this case when this guy, and he was like, yeah, it was the plumber. She's like, how did you know that? He's like, it's the most logical conclusion. Why would a woman let somebody into her house? He must have been there for a reason. So he was obviously a workman. And because she was killed with a blunt object, it actually had to be a plumber who had a wrench. <laughs> and okay. so he reasons it out. And the minute he explained, it's like, it's very much like Sherlock Holmes. Like when he would explain. But well written. Yeah. As opposed to the TV shows, adaptations. Yeah. But it's like yeah. he explains like these logical things and like you realize that his intuitive leaps are obvious if you had sat down and thought about right. them the right way. Um, Harlan Coben. I'm just going to look a bunch of authors that I like. Harlan Coben, he's books and he's done a lot. He's, they've been adapted TV shows. Yeah, I've heard the name. He mysteries? Always, yeah, Mysteries. He always has like this twist at the end. And even though you know that's his style uh -huh. and you know they're coming... He still manages to surprise you. He's like a good M. Night Shyamalan. He's like a good M. Night Shyamalan. 
Um, <laughs> I've read one Louise Penny book and I liked oh, it. Yeah. She's very popular here, right? Yeah, because local. All her yeah. all her mysteries are based in Montreal. So yeah. there you go. I read one. I liked it. It was okay. good. John Hart is an author I like. I didn't like his last book as much, but he's written some very, very good novels, like really solid stuff. Okay. And then I, I enjoy John Grisham. I know it's like, you know, not cool to talk about popular <laughs> books, but he's a good writer. I enjoy reading them. They are easy right. and fun reads. And if you have a chance, go read Philip Kerr. He's passed away now, but he wrote okay. a series of mysteries starring Bernie Gunther, who is a that's German. That's a name. That's a name. He's a German a uh, police detective. Okay. Um, de- like he start the books start just before the rise of the Third Reich and the Weimar mm. Republic, and they go through World War Two, and then there's him in the post-war period. Okay. So it's interesting to see him um, talk about um, you know what it was like to be in you know Germany during that time. The first three books were the like 1920s, 1930s, mm-hmm. and then they were so popular that he came back and wrote a bunch of post-war books about huh. you know and he would travel to countries and he would like expose stuff like what happened afterwards how did all these nazis get to south america like what mm-hmm. were the issues anyway so they're very fun mysteries very film noir type stuff where like you know the hero doesn't really succeed no matter how right. hard he tries and he's very just depressed and like nothing works out it's okay. also very british in some way <laughs> exactly we can't make him smile no and also you wrote, if you're into philosophy... Oh, yeah. The Republic. So, by Plato. By Plato. It's the classic. It's, it's the classic, classic for a reason. I read so that it's as... It's classic. A, so no, nobody's read it. It's right. Uh, I read that as a very, very... When I was very, very young, and it really sort of shaped the way I think about things. And I think it was a, it's a very good book, if you can get through it. I mean, philosophy is obviously hard, but I, I like the classics, because they're oh. classics for a reason. Nolan asks, well, his son asks, when will you make more fake advertisements? Mm. Uh, we probably won't. Mm. It, it was taking a lot of time yeah. to put those together. And uh, I mean, certainly I heard from one person who was just skipping through them. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I, th- I think I think we're done with that. Just again, because it's our show used to be so labor intensive. Yeah. And given the size of our audience, at some point, it just doesn't make sense mm. to spend so much of our time, uh, you know, cre- crafting mm. these little things that, that takes just a lot of time to do. I mean, I don't know, maybe down the road we'll think of something that we'll try just for fun. But yeah, it's, it's it's hard. Like, it has to come organically. Because, yeah, I mean, reason. we were doing like two a month, I think, mm. two to three a month. Like, it was, yeah, it was a lot. At some point, you also kind of run out of ideas. Mm. And uh, Nolan also asked, what happened to Mouton No More? So I used to be part of a production collective, a sort of content network for skepticism here in Montreal. Uh, my previous podcast and blog, or part of this turns out that this kind of content creation is hard, right? Like not everyone mm. is, is cut out for it. It requires self-confidence and discipline and a variety of things happen that meant that we sort of, we split up. It's like a rock band. Sometimes it's just time to move on. And there's this thing that I've said before, which is how do you know if you're the right person for a podcast, for a YouTube series? Mm. Or if, how, how do you know if you really are the kind of person who wants to be uh, invested mm. in science communication, skepticism? And my question is always, can you not do it? Because if you can't not do it, yeah. then that's how you succeed. Because you yeah. just you never stop. Like yeah. you just, it, it's this this in, this this impulse inside of you that makes you go, "I have to do this. I have to get this off my chest." Yeah, because here's the thing: if you do something that you hate, I mean, even if you're successful, you'll still hate doing it. And yeah. if you love what you do, even if you're not successful, you'll love what you're doing. And then the success is just sort of because here's the thing: you're never going to be happy. Right, <laughs> happiness. You will never. You will never be happy, you Christopher will, Lavos. You will never be happy. You will never t-shirt. feel like you've done enough. And I'm sure there are very famous actors who feel like, well, I haven't done enough. I haven't accomplished this. I haven't done that. It's a little bit like imposter syndrome. Like, yeah. What am I doing here? Yeah. Look at so all these you, people. You here. have to do stuff for its own sake and almost not care what the result is. And I think that's. I, I think that's sort of where we are, which is like we take this, we put it out there. And things are going to play out the way they play out. And if you don't worry about it so much, you can enjoy the ride. Because that's really all you have, right? You got, you got one shot at this until we invent the time machine. But until then, we have one shot at this. So you might as well enjoy the ride and do the stuff that is fun. Like, this is fun. It's not earning us any money. <laughs> but, you know. <laughs> pennies. I mean, pennies. Chris. I mean, pe- listen, could we be like, you know, like lying on the couch watching TV right now? Sure. But it's kind of fun to do this stuff, too. Nolan also asks, what have you learned getting a correctional feedback about topics you have covered? Nothing. 
<laughs> I've learned nothing. I've learned nothing. We, um, we rarely get corrections. We rarely get corrections. Sometimes, and sometimes people, the corrections are wrong, and yeah. we have to we have to double correct we have to ourselves. Double correct ourselves. <laughs> oh well, yes. What was that? Uh, uh, pesticides oh versus uh, pesticides, pesticides versus herbicides. Yeah, yeah. That, that was a weird rabbit hole. <laughs> um, no, because it, yeah, it was this whole thing about what like is the label correct to say herbicide or pesticide, and like how are these things used uh, professionally mm-hmm. rather than colloquially. Uh, so there's stuff like that. That was a that was a fun thing. The correction of a correction, and then at one point you're like, "We're not doing this anymore. <laughs> Stop. Stop." Uh, David asks, "Will you be doing any more readings from Chris's book?" I mean, we could. I mean, you know, we could. Yeah. If if if, if that's what you people want, just yeah. let us know. Let us know. We'll do some more readings. Final question mm. from Paul, who asks, "What signs of hope do you see in this work as you reflect back and look ahead?" Is there any Hmm. question mark? So at times like this, it becomes important to reference the Buffy cinematic universe. Uh, Is there a cinematic universe? Well, there's Buffy Buffy, Buffy and Angel. Oh, well, it's a a televisual Televisual universe. Television universe. Sure. Okay. Um, You know, I think this is from Angel. It's like the battle is never won. It's just fought. We live as we should be to show the world what it can be. Wow. And so this is what we do. We do this because, you know, there's never not going to be an anti-science movement. It's just that you make incremental gains. Like there is no pseudoscience about how to treat pneumonia now, right? There is no pseudoscience about, because once things are easily fixable, you just fix them. Mm -hmm. So there's always going to be some, you know, anti-science thing and then we'll come and go and it'll change and i mean you know and it'll come back 20, it'll come 25 back. years later yeah, exactly but there is progress like nobody really says vaccines cause autism anymore oh you'd be surprised well there's a fringe but it's not a thing so it's like you got to keep advance you gotta you gotta keep a systematic advancing of, if you don't do it then yeah. the other side wins yeah like yeah. There, there has to be a quote unquote there has to be a resistance yeah because otherwise, if you just say, well, what's the point? I mean, yeah. you know, people will believe whatever they want to believe yeah. and pseudoscience is more appealing and yeah. it works on emotions. So why even bother? Well, yeah. if you don't bother, then measles comes back. Yeah. And maybe measles would be worse, even worse now that mm. would affect even more people if, you know, skeptics and medical professionals mm. didn't try to hold the line yeah. uh, as it were. So yeah. you, you do it because you have to, because the, um, the, the, the opposite of that is to do nothing and mm. the results are going to be even worse. Yep. Exactly. When we come back, a major announcement that will change this podcast forever. Bum, bum, bum. I, can, I think I can guess what the surprise is. What do you think it is? Are you going to replay our first episode? <clears throat> we'll see. Okay. Welcome back to the final stretch of The Body of Evidence, episode 100, Ask Us Anything. Um, Yeah, big announcement. Chris doesn't know what I'm about to do. Okay. Um, He has a guess, Mm -hmm. and that guess is wrong. Oh. So you thought that it was going to be... I thought we were going to replay our first episode and listen to it. Oh, no, God, no. (laughs) Uh, No, look, it's that... I mean, we're we're a lot busier than we used to be, right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, it's just becoming... Too much work yeah. to do the podcast anymore. Yeah. But I found people to replace us. Okay. Um, they have very generously decided to donate their time okay. to do this. And so, um, look, I mean, I, I'm i very happy with the doctor that I found to replace you. Okay. Because he sounds very similar to you. Okay. And so I'm going to play you uh, a, a, little, uh, a little excerpt uh, right now. I have a confession to make, Jonathan. I really hate puppies. They are the worst. I don't understand why people would get a dog. It just baffles me. Now, to change the topic a bit, people often ask me, Chris, what is the secret to your success and your flawless skin? I say, number one, drink a little bit of wine every day and force yourself to if you have to. It can cure cancer. It literally can cure cancer. Also, smoking is great. A lot of people got on the smoking debunking craze, and it's all nonsense. Smoking is great. And be Greek. Being Greek will guarantee you will look like a Greek god. If you want to know how to be healthy, just listen to Joe Rogan. He is a fantastic podcaster, always up on the latest research. And quite frankly, we should just stop the body of evidence. We can't compete with that guy. Also, my favorite color is chartreuse. Good night, everyone. Oh, God. 
is that AI generated? Yes, it was. Oh, God. The future is horrible. <laughs> oh, we are so screwed. I cloned your voice. Oh, goodness. <laughs> it took five minutes. Oh, goodness. Yep. This is what the future holds. Yes, this I is, know. This is what the future holds. It, it sounds pretty close to your voice. It's pretty close, yeah, I have to say. I mean, it doesn't sound right, but I mean, a casual listener, I don't think we'd be able to tell the difference. It, it over-nasalizes your ah sound, yeah, yeah. so it makes you sound more American. But other than that, it's pretty close. Yeah. Wow. Man, I mean... People, <laughs> Do you feel violated right now? I feel worried. <laughs> I feel worried. I mean, you know, and they, they do this with like, you know, Hollywood people all the time. They're yeah. Like, oh my goodness. <sighs> well, I mean, of course I couldn't just do you. Yeah. I have to be fair. Yeah. And so here is the AI version of me. Okay. I have a big announcement to make. It is now clear to me that there is no money to be made in skepticism. So for the past three years, I have been going to night school and I finally graduated last night. Mm. I am now a certified Reiki practitioner. Mm. I'm very happy about that. I think that the only way to eradicate cancer and measles and dementia is to rely on therapeutic touch. My brand new clinic will be open next month. There will be whale music playing and incense burning Mm. and I will hover my hands over anyone who has the money to pay me. Go Reiki. <laughs> mm. Well, you know, Reiki is like when you want to be a massage therapist, but you don't like touching people. Exactly. Yeah. Again, pretty good. Pretty good. The um, the pacing is a little off. Yeah. It's kind of, it feels a little bit rushed, but yeah, it's like ninety percent there. If you if we wrote out a podcast script mm-hmm. and like had this do it, do you think people would be able to tell the difference? I mean, yes. I mean, yeah. a, sh- a short segment, maybe not. Yeah. But a whole podcast with us interacting like yeah. this back and forth. It would be, and it would be hard because it would have to generate each voice separately, right? And mix and them together. Mix them together, yeah. But like, if you're not paying attention and you're on social media and this mm. gets played, and you're on like speakerphone or what have you, or on your ed, uh, headphones, yeah. uh, and there's 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 noise around you, you or might, you're in your or you're in your car, like the Bluetooth, you might car. not pick up on those subtle. And this is the worst that it's gonna ever gonna be. Yeah, it's only gonna get better. It's only gonna get better. So, uh, yeah. AI is coming for all of us, people. Yeah. There was this show on Amazon. And it was like a British mystery. And I forget what it's called. It was called the... Anyways, the the basic premise was this... I'll, I'll spoil the ending, sorry. This group was so worried about AI-generated images being used as evidence mm-hmm. that they basically framed somebody for murder using doctored video with the okay. plan that once he got convicted, they would reveal that it was doctored, yeah. he would get released... And then they would show people that you can't rely on video anymore. Mm-hmm. But then the woman who fakes her death actually gets murdered. <laughs> and it's like this whole thing about government because the government wants to use this so that they can frame people. It came out recently, right? Yeah, not that long ago. I, uh, yeah, I, I think I read a review of it. I can't, I can't remember what it was called. Yeah, and okay. It was, uh, yeah, it's basically this. It was like how, yeah, we can't trust anything. That's one of, one of my biggest fears, like video evidence. Yeah. I mean, will we, will we still trust video evidence a year from now? I, I don't think we will. I don't think we will. Because it's too easily to doctor. So that's frightening. <laughs> I'm scared. But I'm at least scared. we know that your favorite color is chartreuse. Chartreuse. <laughs> that was funny. That was funny. Well, uh, we hope that you enjoyed yeah. uh, this episode. Thank you for all your questions. Thank you for being listeners. Yeah. Uh, for some of you for being patrons. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, here's to 100 more. In, uh, hopefully, yeah. fingers crossed, uh, unless we get replaced by our AI avatars. By our AI avatars. You never know. <laughs> we never know. Uh, we'll see you again in two weeks. Ciao for now. Bye-bye. And that's the end of our show. Theme music by Joseph Hackle. You can find him on Bandcamp as Teflon Joe. Illustrations by Luke Wallette. To support our show, go to bodyofevidence.ca slash about or find us on Patreon. Patrons of our show get a bonus episode each month called Digressions. Our website is bodyofevidence.ca. The Body of Evidence is not affiliated with the McGill Office for Science and Society and is a production of 1254-0851 Canada, Inc. And when trying to decide if a study is good or not, remember the Body of Evidence creed. A study in mice is not a study in people. Coincidences are easy. Proving causation is hard. Scientific studies are like movies. Some are just bad. We can't stop at a single study. We have to look at the body of evidence.